Bueno, voy a hacer una pequeña introducción eh, y después Miquel... I'm going to start uh, with a short introduction uh, for some context. And very much connected uh, with what we saw yesterday about the Basque uh, row in the Mediterranean. And only the Kahman's book, in three different volumes, three different books, talks mostly about Mediterranean trade uh, with the crown of Catalonia. And uh, he talked uh, about the relevance of Basque shipping. He talks about Baonesque or ba Bayonesque um, ships. In 1975, Arcadi Garcia uh, also published uh, a book, The History of Catalan Navy, where he talks about uh, the Basque presence uh, and he talks about clinker ships or cokes. I think that was uh, the time when I started thinking, ooh, wouldn't it be good if we found a bus wreck uh, near the Catalan coast? Well, in 2008, uh, fortunately, Barceloneta won, the wreck was found. It was excavated by Mikel's team. And uh, happily, and finally enough, Mikel is Basque, is fate, right, is destiny. The underwater uh, archaeology center in Catalonia asked me uh, to collaborate with Mikel. And that's what we did, together with a fantastic team of people, a multidisciplinary team. He's reading through the names of some of the people in the team. And now Mikel is going to tell you about the excavation process, how the wreck was found, and a little bit about the historical context uh, in this 15th century and how Basque uh, ships and seamen uh, had a very relevant role in the Western Mediterranean. I should also tell you that next year uh, the uh, museum in Barcelona uh, will open an exhibition uh, where Barcelona won, uh, the piece of the hull, uh, will be one of the main exhibits. So, uh, let me just add a couple of details uh, after Marcel's introduction. Firstly, uh, I want to thank the organizers for allowing us to be here today to tell you about uh, our wreck, which is a tiny fragment, really, compared to the Newport, Newport uh, ship, our big brother we call the Newport wreck. So, because we don't have a great deal of time, uh, I'm going to uh, focus on the document I brought for my presentation. The finding uh, took place in May 2008 within uh, the framework uh, of a large archaeological intervention. This is the site. As uh, we very often see, uh, as a result of uh, an accidental finding uh, during uh, some building work between the Barceloneta district and the Born district in Barcelona. So, that's why uh, we decided uh, Barceloneta had to be the name for the wreck. The excavation started in 2006 and uh, some traces uh, had been found before then, uh, pieces of wood uh, that indicated it might be a wreck uh, of a clinker ship, also a fragment of a keel, and also uh, a piece of 
the outer shell. So, after the first part of the project, above um, the sea level, we continued below the sea level, uh, and the stratigraphic sequence can be summarized uh, with four main landmarks uh, that will give us uh, good information about the coastline uh, from uh, the late uh, Roman period uh, to uh, modern times uh, during the 16th century. So, uh, let me start uh, telling you uh, that uh, Around about this, uh, the ninth century, uh, this area was a lagoon protected uh, by a sandbar at the time uh, that ran through uh, practically all of the Barcelona seaboard, uh, which locally was referred to as Tasha or Tasca. That didn't make uh, the area into a safe harbor, but still uh, this sandbar provided protection uh, for trade and uh, shipping into the port. So, uh, I mentioned how this was a lagoon uh, and at minus five under uh, the sea level uh, in the mud, that's where the fragments were found for Barceloneta 1. We recovered a, a piece of cask, of the hole, sorry, uh, of 4.10 meters uh, by 2.72 in width together with uh, the other fragments I mentioned earlier uh, that were found previously uh, that pointed to a clinker vessel. So, because of the mud uh, in the lagoon uh, during the early Middle Ages, a little bit to the west uh, where the wreck was found. Uh, that's when, uh, in 1439, a wharf was built so that uh, the sandbar that had been protecting uh, the area uh, because of sedimentation changes uh, started uh, to dissolve and uh, it just went. partly covering our wreck. So, uh, uh, since uh, 1477, a new breakwater uh, was built. Here we can see the stratigraphic sequence. And I would like to just here point where the wreck was found, uh, covered by sand, sitting on the mud from the lagoon. Sand uh, is portrayed uh, as yellow. And then, uh, this is where we can see uh, the second attempt uh, to building a port in the city of Barcelona, with the breakwater uh, that uh, was finally uh, successful in our excavation, but you get an idea there of the size of the structure. Uh, that's the history and archaeology around uh, co archaeological context for uh, the wreck, Barceloneta 1. We have uh, drafted a document uh, gathering all the information about the different stratigraphic layers, um, describing the role of Basque, uh, the Basque Navy in the Mediterranean or uh, trade uh, in and out of uh, the city of Barcelona. Uh, with the role played by Basque ships. If somebody asked me to summarize what Barceloneta 1 actually is, well, I could say that uh, it is 
the hole below the waterline of uh, either a now or a barcha, uh, we would call it in Catalan, <coughs> built uh, with the inner hole technique and a clinker planking on the outer layer with uh, 11 uh, lines uh, of uh, planks and you can see how this outer hull, uh, we can see quite clearly uh, the overlap of the planks uh, which is typical in the clinker technique. 11 uh, planks uh, have been retrieved, uh, although uh, none of them uh, is whole lengthwise, they've, they've all been broken. Uh, the width uh, is around from 21.5 centimeters to 23.5, and uh, the thickness is between 2.5 and 2.8 centimeters. Another interesting uh, piece that was found uh, was a possible inwork or bilge stringer that could be like an internal reinforcement part. Uh, to help uh, better join uh, the fatogs uh, to the floor timber with very irregular uh, sections and joints, uh, which uh, makes all the sense in the world uh, to, uh, for, for the frames. The planks uh, for the outer uh, Hope has a, a, an offset uh, for the scarf joints, which lengthwise, uh, sorry, widthwise, it would be 5 to 6.5 centimeter uh, offset. So, going from bow to stern, uh, the rows of planks uh, are scarf jointed or offset uh, in a length of from 33 to 36.5 centimeters, uh, going towards the bow, uh, whereas uh, going towards the stern, uh, the difference uh, in the offset is between one and two centimeters. The fastening uh, is done as usual with iron nails uh, with a round head, round about four centimeters in diameter uh, that have, they were nailed from the outside and going first through the plank, the upper plank and then the lower plank. All of that reinforced uh, with uh, iron riveting, sometimes uh, square, sometimes uh, rectangular, sometimes a uh, diamond shape, uh, from 3.5 to 4.5 centimeters. Something that we couldn't quite see uh, is uh, if it was like in the Urbieta um, with bent nails, or if they were cut. Well, there's only one uh, of the nails that uh, have been found where we can clearly see a 90 degree bent, uh, but that's the only, the only one. Uh, in the rest, we, we couldn't see what the technique was. Here we can see the rectangular uh, frames. Well, the shape, sorry, uh, of the nails uh, for the frames. The separation uh, or distance between uh, the nails uh, is at most 13 well, to 23 centimeters, but most of them uh, have a distance between them between 17 and 18 centimeters. Repair work had been done on the hull uh, and uh, in two different uh, planks and uh, there is a little offset on these and even uh, some holes uh, on the inner side uh, that uh, would have been the place where the tree nails would have been located originally. Uh, because then those tree nails uh, were not replaced, but iron nails were used. And uh, those, the repair work uh, is very obvious. Uh, you can clearly see the technique is different uh, from the original clinker hull. 
Finally, uh, I should say that uh, the longitudinal elements on the whole uh, uh, tell us which side or band uh, we have. Which strip we, ha we find? Quite simply, uh, because of the offset and the scarf joint technique, we can tell uh, that uh, in this case uh, it's a piece from the post side. Now, let's talk about the frames. It was obvious that uh, one of the frames was missing. I think you can probably just see it here. There was the gap that told us that uh, that's where the frame should have been. Most of the frames, uh, frame fragments we found uh, uh, were quite short. Uh, we didn't retrieve a whole frame in any case. As usual in the clinker technique, uh, the outer side on the frames uh, has um, a rebate or offset uh, of 15 to 18 centimeters. Uh, so, um, this characteristic once again uh, the riveting technique was found on the nails the uh, assembly of uh, the frames and securing uh, was done uh, with three nails so, uh, I'm giving you uh, these details um, and I'm hoping that uh, you will find, uh, get an idea of the size of the ship. For instance, uh, the width of the frame and the gap between frames uh, and the distance uh, from one tree now to the next. All of those details uh, give us an idea of uh, the size of a ship. The width of the frames uh, that we have found at the top of the frames uh, has a minimum of 14 centimeters, a maximum of 25 centimeters in what uh, we found at least, and then on average it would be 21.5 centimeters. For those of you who are familiar with the new portrait, uh, it is very, very similar. The gaps uh, between uh, the frames, the, the nails, sorry, is on average uh, 10 point 10.25 centimeters, and uh, uh, the frames seem to be quite uh, irregular in shape. Uh, with a distance between three nails, in that case, uh, between 27 and 37 centimeters. I mentioned earlier uh, the offset and uh, the scarf jointed technique. Well, once we restored uh, the pieces, uh, we found that uh, in uh, these offset points, uh, an irregular hole uh, was practiced uh, between 5 to 10 centimeters. Uh, the carving uh, is not very careful, uh, particularly. The idea uh, for that was that internal riveting uh, would sit properly and so that uh, the inner hull would, uh, the frames would sit properly. So this uh, final uh, element I've mentioned, this last element I mentioned, uh, the frames uh, help us uh, understand uh, where they would be uh, in the hull. Sometimes the radius, uh, sometimes, although it's only fragments, obviously, but uh, uh, we found fragments of the uh, second 
sorry, of the floor timber and uh, the second fatok. You can see here uh, the picture showing uh, the floor timber and then the second fatak. The assembly uh, was always done uh, with um, tree nails and the idea is that uh, assembly was done uh, on the first fatoks uh, at the bottom of them. You can see here how they look very smooth, uh, there's no offsetting no scarf joints uh, at this point, uh, which uh, is very obvious later on. Then, uh, looking uh, at the planking and uh, remembering what I said about the photos, uh, assembly was done mostly with uh, overlapping uh, of some 45 centimeters on the inner side, but uh, on frames uh, four and six, uh, it was done on the external side. That's why it looks very smooth. Uh, with, uh, over. It's, uh, we only found fragments. Uh, we don't know if uh, this was uh, done this way on alternate uh, planks or um, if it was um, continuous. This pattern was continuous. But I, I'm just mentioning this uh, so you can understand that uh, with a little fragment uh, of floor plank. Uh, floor timber and the second uh, fatak, uh, we get a pretty good idea of where they would be in the hull. Uh, then the offsets uh, help the fatak uh, better uh, sit with the floor planking. Now let's talk about how the hull would be uh, watertight. Um, often fur was used uh, together with tar, or uh, in other case, cases uh, like ours, uh, it would be moss. We have found moss uh, that would have come uh, from uh, areas, any area pr practically, in the Iberian Peninsula. Pachieras and Marta Infante, together with Santiago Riera, have studied uh, the moss samples, uh, finding uh, oak, um, well, different uh, tree species and ve vegetable species uh, that would have come from north, the northern Spanish area. Apart from the moss, uh, tar was found, and geochemical study uh, of uh, the tar samples uh, find that uh, pine resin was used together with different minerals like silica or saponite uh, that is uh, found uh, very nearby in Montjuic, for instance, in Barcelona. Well, not just there, in <laughs> other places as well. So the pollen uh, contained in the tar uh, was quite low, probably because tarring was done uh, in winter, uh, where there is less pollen. Uh, but what we found uh, was totally compatible uh, with the Mediterranean area, uh, with uh, pine or olive tree and uh, different uh, vegetable species. So uh, this would have been a vessel built uh, uh, on the Spanish northern coast that was repaired in the Mediterranean basin, maybe even in Barcelona. When we studied the wood, uh, the anthracological study uh, has shown that uh, oak trees were used uh, for shipbuilding, except for the repair planks, uh, which are pine. Dendochronological study led by Marta Dominguez uh, doesn't point to any other known wreck. But, for instance, Brad Lowen uh, mentioned only recently uh, that 
how splitting uh, was very common, that technique. And uh, in this case, uh, trees uh, were used uh, from around about 100 years in age uh, for the hull, but not for the frames. Uh, they would have been a lot younger. So let's separate uh, the time uh, when the, build, uh, the ship was built uh, and when uh, it was lost. Carbon dating uh, of the wood and the moss, even more interestingly, uh, tell us about the building time. Uh, the, and uh, just to make sure that it wasn't recovered uh, Wood. Uh, so uh, carbon dating uh, looks like from 1310 to 1440 and also studying the sediments uh, we have managed to uh, um, say that it's probably 1410 uh, when the ship was built uh, and it makes all the sense from a historical point of view. The stratigraphic uh, context uh, where the wreck was found uh, help, help us, uh, helps us uh, date the time when the ship was lost. Uh, the date would be round about 1439. Uh, that's the time when the ship was lost, which again makes sense uh, because that's when the uh, wharf started uh, to be built, uh, the sand barrier uh, started to dissolve and uh, also the, the ceramic fragments we found uh, make sense. Here we have different documentary sources. For instance, uh, the diary uh, of sessions uh, held at Conseil de Saint, uh, which would be like the council, city council at the time. So, uh, in the period between 1420 and 1426, uh, the diary of uh, the council sessions talk about two Castilian vessels uh, having been lost at that time during that period. So, uh, that makes sense uh, with our hypothesis and uh, it makes sense with some of the evidence uh, that we found of uh, the vessel uh, being uh, being disassembled and uh, the fact that uh, the seventh frame uh, is missing uh, the ship uh, might have uh, sunk uh, and uh, was lost and then uh, was expoiled. All these um, facts and figures I'm giving you are not definitive uh, as to the precedence. Uh, we can only uh, propose a very large area uh, that would go from Galicia in northwestern Spain to uh, the Garona uh, flowing into the ocean. We still need to look for more evidence uh, to be able to point to a more specific uh, precedence. So, Barceloneta 1 uh, was clearly uh, a clinker uh, ship. Uh, some of the early Atlantic uh, vessels uh, that would access the Mediterranean at a time uh, when the rigging, the hull technique uh, would have been very different from what locals uh, were used to. Which is why uh, when uh, sources refer to these vessels at that time, they call them Bayonets, clinker ships, Biscayan or Castilian. 
the around the 15th century, uh, as Marcel said yes, uh, earlier on, uh, structural differences between these two different styles uh, started uh, to uh, be less. Uh, for instance, at that time, uh, clinker technique or uh, the name of cog uh, is uh, not common anymore. Uh, 1420, the 1420s would have probably been the uh, separation uh, for those two periods. At that time, uh, Castilian would have been a normal name for that type of vessel. Uh, both nows and barchas, uh, the Catalan term, uh, were used uh, to uh, refer to those vessels, barcha or barcha. But uh, those vessels were never referred uh, to uh, as uh, Castilian. Uh, when there were whalers, for instance, or when there were carvels. But uh, ve vessels coming from Andalusia uh, that were barchas in typology were never referred to as barchas. Uh, only uh, Catalonian and uh, Basque vessels would be called that way. So uh, this makes all the sense uh, with our hypothesis for our wreck uh, and connecting them uh, with uh, the two sources from 1420 and 1426 talking about two Castilian vessels that had been lost in the Barcelona uh, area. So the connection between uh, the fleets in Galicia and in the Basque country uh, and their clinker techniques uh, might help us uh, under, better understand uh, this term of Castilian vessels uh, for us to understand the procedence, the provenance uh, for our wreck. wreck. There was a task uh, in the city of uh, Barcelona called Ancoraja uh, that uh, started in 1439 to uh, fund uh, the building work of the port in Barcelona. Uh, Bota uh, was uh, Bota or cask or barrica. Uh, it's, it's all the same thing. Uh, that was uh, the currency at the time. So we have documents uh, about arrivals, all the arrivals, uh, with an idea of the cargo. I'm talking about some 25,000 voyages uh, uh, that were registered. So, uh, in great detail, day by day, uh, knowing the provenance uh, of the vessel, the name uh, of uh, the skipper, and so on. So, most uh, of these cases, uh, including uh, Galician and uh, Basque vessels, were uh, done in bachas or nows, except uh, for this particular period that we're referring to for our wreck, uh, where whalers uh, seemed uh, quite quite frequent. So, looking at that information uh, from that source and focusing on the period between 1439 to 1447, uh, if we look for uh, Galician ships or uh, ships with Galician uh, captains, uh, only batches uh, were mentioned, with a minimum load, uh, cargo, sorry, of uh, 60 casks and a maximum of 170, whereas uh, Basque uh, ships uh, have a, a more broad typology, uh, mostly bachas, but also some nows, and some uh, balleners or uh, whalers, and uh, with a uh, cargo of uh, between 350 and 500 uh, casks and on average 160 uh, casks uh, 
for the Basque shipping. So thinking about uh, cases like the Newport rack or the uh, other rack, uh, we can see uh, that the Basque uh, models, uh, that the size between 60 to 100 current tons, make sense. In archaeological remains, uh, Barceloneta uh, 1 uh, would probably then be a Pacha, uh, more so than a now. Or if we want to be really strict, uh, then uh, we would say that uh, they would have called it a Pacha at the time. So what's the difference between a now and a pacha? Well, not um, huge. Maybe during the Q&A session later, uh, I can give you more details. Uh, but we have some documentary sources uh, that explain uh, that difference. And uh, the Ancuracha tax uh, records uh, seem to have no problem identifying uh, which was which one was a pacha and which one was an now and they're very consistent when the same vessel uh, comes back to Barcelona time and time again they never get it wrong so uh, what's the difference uh, just size the size well, uh, our documents uh, talk about nows uh, uh, with a very broad uh, difference in tonnage, but they were still called nows. So, um, I would also like to tell you a little bit about other sources, documentary sources, for instance, free fleets, freight uh, and cargo uh, that was, uh, sorry, um, the crew, uh, the crews that were hired in Barcelona, information about the sailors, and uh, we see how towards the end of the 15th century, uh, a big change uh, took place with larger size ships uh, being more common then. Uh, skippers uh, often came from the Basque country, if we call the Basque country from uh, San Sebastian uh, to uh, the west and to the east, although I found it quite striking uh, fi not finding any skippers from Odio or from Legatio. We don't see any effects uh, after the consulate uh, was set up in Bilbao about names uh, that have been recorded for the vessels in documentary sources. Well, they're often very repetitive. Mostly it's uh, the saints that uh, would protect sailors and ships. And uh, we found uh, Roussignol, uh, only one case, uh, uh, where, like Ure Chindorra in, uh, in Euskera, in the Basque language, uh, which would be Nightingale. That's the only case where the local language was used as opposed to saints' names. So, uh, I would like to finish my presentation with a very brief overview about uh, the life cycle of these vessels, how they would uh, sail in the Mediterranean and mostly in the area of Barcelona, the city of Barcelona. There are uh, famous studies, for instance, by Jacques Hertz, and also more recent publications by Maria Teresa Ferrer y Mayol uh, in the Ichas Memori Memoria Journal. Why were Basque vessels uh, there in the Mediterranean? In the Mediterranean, well, uh, quite simply because ports like Genoa, Valencia, or Barcelona uh, needed uh, merchant ships. Basque uh, ships uh, and uh, skippers were there partly uh, because of uh, the trade. Uh, 
And yet, uh, there are some uh, history commonplaces uh, about uh, how uh, Basque shipping worked, uh, which they have sometimes confirmed, sometimes found contradicting information in our documentary sources. What are those commonplaces uh, that I uh, am referring to about the Basque presence uh, in the Mediterranean Sea? The first one would be how uh, Basque ships uh, would have just focused uh, in certain geographies and uh, in the trade or transport, more like, of certain products. Products that might have been cheap, we're told, and uh, either very heavy or very bulky. We've been told for a long time uh, that uh, those were the goods uh, that Basques specialized in uh, during the Middle Ages, and uh, we have found evidence uh, to the contrary. For instance, in the so-called uh, wheat routes that we can see up on the screen into the city of Barcelona, coming from Sardinia, from the French Provence, and from southern Sicily. Well, uh, Basque ships uh, took uh, salt and uh, sheep's wool in the routes that we can see up on the screen, from La Mata in Alicante or from Ibiza, uh, salt pans, and then connecting also Genoa uh, in that route. Basque ships uh, had been very present uh, between uh, Liguria uh, and Barcelona uh, in, in that uh, confrontation. Or cheese, sugar, uh, and sugar from Sicily, or the trip to Cagliari uh, by uh, Emilio de Sumaya uh, in 1474, where he took cloth, uh, a windmill, uh, and a mule. You can see uh, quite a broad range of products. So, what about the geographical area where um, Castilian uh, barchas, including Basque barchas, uh, would move? Well, uh, our uh, taxation records I mentioned earlier uh, tell us that um, it's not true that Basque shipping just focused on very, very specific uh, geographical areas. Uh, we can see there the yel, yel in yellow, Sicily, Genoa, uh, like the French Provence, uh, Flanders, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Castilian, uh, Castile, Castile, with uh, not just the main ports, uh, but also uh, not so important ports like Blanes or Cadaques, uh, Basque ships uh, taking uh, cargo uh, into Barcelona from those uh, areas. So uh, they look, it looks like they were quite flexible and uh, they would ship just about anywhere. In the 16th century, uh, Basque ships uh, were also very much present down south uh, in the area between Cadiz and Seville, and also with uh, the star trade uh, with between Barcelona and uh, Alexandria uh, between uh, 1482 and 1523. Uh, we see uh, Basque Pachas uh, covering that route. So that commonplace, right, or that list of commonplaces uh, handed down by history uh, told us that Basque ships just focused on certain areas and uh, we, we, we have found uh, that was not the case. So looking at the total volume of cargo uh, in and out of Barcelona between 1439 and 1447, uh, we understand then that Basque ships uh, specialized uh, in the uh, best niche, uh, which is the Western Mediterranean. 
Uh, you see how the yellow marks uh, travel downwards uh, up on the screen. Oh, uh, that's again the same explanation. Is it Basque ships uh, changing uh, their territory? Not really. Uh, it's just that uh, Basque ships adapted uh, to the market uh, that had changed. Uh, the market had moved further down south. These voyages uh, were meant to be not very sophisticated. That's uh, another commonplace about Basque shipping. True. Uh, some of these voyages were uh, simple routes with just a two or three scales, but that's not always the case. For instance, Ochoa de Motricu. Uh, in 1436, uh, that Bacha uh, was recorded uh, as uh, being in Seville, which is where Ochoa, the Basque uh, Ochoa, uh, used to live. Well, he then went to Salo, then to Valencia, then uh, to Cagliari, then to Palermo, then Naples, then back to Parle Palermo. Uh, uh, he went uh, loading in southern Sicily and then back to Valencia. Uh, or another example, uh, Martin de Bertendona from uh, Bilbao, who in 1505, uh, his voyage went from Barcelona to then Seville, then Cadiz, then uh, Lampoya, uh, where the Re uh, Ebro River flows into the Mediterranean, uh, then Barcelona, then Majorca, then Palermo, then Messina, then Rhodes, Rhodes, uh, then back to Messina again, then uh, loading wheat again uh, from Sicily, uh, from southern Sicily, and back to then uh, Valencia or Barcelona. Well, these are pretty sophisticated routes, right? Uh, it's not just a one-scale, simple um, voyage. So, last but not least, uh, these two uh, commonplaces uh, have uh, another companion. Uh, another commonplace is that Basque ships were not interested in trades. Like Basques didn't want to be merchants, uh, Basques being an isolated people who didn't know about these things, uh, who would have rejected trade as a way of living. Well, um, they would have been like aliens at the time, right? Uh, it, it just seems like a very odd proposal. Um, Basque skippers, uh, why wouldn't they make the most of uh, opportunities that might arise to uh, make a profit? So, uh, we uh, have found evidence uh, to the contrary. For instance, uh, Pedro Sarchis de Ormachi from Ondarroa, uh, who was, that was fleeted by Mikel Botellier uh, in Tortosa. So it's Ondarroa in one case and Tortosa in the other case, um, with cargo going to Genoa. Well, when Sanchez got uh, to uh, the destination, uh, he made a good business. Uh, we don't know if it was uh, just uh, to transport the goods or as a merchant. Or, for instance, uh, Pedro Martino from Ondarwa, uh, the year, uh, the following year, he loaded the salt uh, he had agreed uh, to transport uh, together with goods for, uh, belonging to other merchants, making a good profit from that. Or uh, Luis de Arriaga from Bilbao in 1463 uh, with his journey from Barcelona to Genoa. As an interesting case, because uh, the outfitters uh, were uh, Juan de Cebedio and Pedro de Artata, uh, who were uh, the registrar and the carpenter, respectively, uh, of that ship. So, the outfitter of the ship, uh, who, who was it? Well, it was the crew uh, in that case. So, skippers uh, were not just interested in transport, uh, they also wanted to make uh, uh, good money uh, if there was a possibility as merchants. 
other examples uh, of trade uh, in Barcelona uh, connected uh, with Basques was Juan Martínez de Goitia, uh, not a sailor, but uh, an hostaler, uh, that is, an innkeeper, um, who used to live in Barcelona. Well, we have documents uh, connected with him talking about deals uh, that were made between Catalan merchants, or sometimes Italian merchants, and Basque skippers, which says a lot about Basque integration uh, in the city of Barcelona. Uh, they would have accounted for 10 to 15 percent of the population in Barcelona. Uh, well, uh, even so, uh, Pedro Ximénez de Bermeo in 1460 managed to sell a slave uh, um, an 18-year-old uh, Arab called Ali. So, towards uh, the late 14th century, uh, at the end of the Middle Ages, then, uh, the Basque presence uh, was uh, even consolidated uh, in the Mediterranean adapting their routes, uh, the size of their ships, and uh, at least in the case of Barcelona, maybe uh, in the cases of Genoa and other cities as well, a complete integration into the trading system. Thank you for your passion. Bueno, brevemente, si hay alguna pregunta. Briefly, are there any questions from the floor? Because uh, otherwise we'll move to uh, conclusions, which would be the end of this conference. Uh, we're going to be having a short roundtable where we're going to be uh, discussing uh, the main uh, topics that we've been dealing with, that have to do with now Victoria. Yes, I have a question. Uh, the term bayonesca, could it be somehow um, telling us something about some origin? I mean, uh, taking into good consideration that that term was used before the 15th century. Uh, does it tell us about the provenance? I don't know how you call that tax you mentioned. The Coracha, uh, we knew where uh, skippers came from. Most of them came from the Basque Country, but I would like to know if uh, there are some continental skippers. Um, so the fact that we see that term used previously, can we pr can it be, tell us that there is provenance from the continent, or just uh, this term is used to or only apply to the Basque Country? I mean, do we need to? include continental uh, people with the Basque people or not, how, when, <laughs> well, <laughs> the European, uh, not continental, maybe. I don't know if uh, my question is very clear. Sí, the, the term uh, bayonesca or bayonesa is uh, only used in documents from the 14th century. You don't see it in uh, documents from the 15th century. Normally, the bayonescas, uh, of course, make a reference to the city of Bayonne in France. But, uh, it is also a synonym for ships coming from the Atlantic Sea. So if skippers and sailors coming from uh, this area are called Vizcaínos, all of them coming from Cantabria or the region of Guipúzcoa, the vessels are called bayonescas, but only to make a difference between them and the Mediterranean vessels because they're different, technically speaking. And then it's a term that was used in the Mediterranean Sea when the ships uh, adopt uh, the uh, Atlantic technology. I'm oh, very sorry, but no mics being used. We cannot hear the question. El famoso timón de Codaste, ¿no? Sí. Que si en la documentación aparecía a la, a la Navarres o a la Bayonés, venía un poco por ahí. Es una curiosidad saber 
stand post a la bayonnaise sometimes. But yes, you answered my question, basically. Uh, so everything that's bayonnaise is identified as being uh, coming from the northern Iberian coast. Yes, they come from that region, that's it, from a part of, of, of that uh, northern Iberian coast, from Cantabria to the Basque country. Yes, just to answer uh, concerning the task, Curacha, uh, so far I haven't found uh, any document that allows me to, to locate it in northern uh, French Basque country, only in southern or Spanish Basque country. Any more questions from the floor? Comment about that comment made earlier by Xavier Agote. I'm very sorry, I don't know if the mic's on, but I can't hear uh, much. But the sound doesn't reach the booth. I don't know if the mic is on. I'd be very happy to translate if you turn it on or put it closer to the mouth. I don't know, it's not working very well. El relato del viaje de vuelta. Much better. The narrative of the uh, um, voyage uh, is only covering four pages. Oui, c'est juste un, un point de complément par rapport au, à l'expression. Un apunte respecto a la expresión bayonesa. En primer lugar. Se trata de una estructura naval de origen bélico de inicios del siglo XV. Hay un manuscrito de Michel Drott al respecto. En 1500, perdón, de 1410-1420 y se distingue, por ejemplo, bien entre el timón lateral y el timón a la bayonesa. Eh, ya a principios del siglo XV, como digo, eh, en el Mediterráneo se realiza esa distinción entre el, el sistema mediterráneo y esa tradición bayonesa y más atlántica, en definitiva. ¿Respondo en francés o en español? ¿Francés o en español? Uh, sí, uh, de acuerdo, en el libro de marinería de Miquel uh, de Rodi. Yes, en el libro de Miquel de Rodi, en 1410, hay una referencia a la Bayonés System. But uh, from uh, the 1430s, that term Bayonese ceased to be used because that um, axial uh, um, system was called uh, stern rudder or stern post, whereas the double side. Um, Rudder is going to be called Latin uh, rudder to make to make a difference between that and what is not. But the sound is awful and we cannot hear anything from the booth. I don't know if this is because uh, too many mics are open, but uh, translating is impossible with this sound. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo has dicho? La treu. Sí, la vela cuadra es el treu. Yo sí tengo otra preguntita. Question for you. You showed us a list of ships and you told us about origins. Uh, you also mentioned the, the term balleners, whalers. Where are they from? Oh, most of them. Do you know that? Generally speaking, in this period of time, there are Catalan whalers, people from southern France that have whalers, some Italians as well. 
So that's a big problem. That it's a shape that's hard to define. Does it have uh, ores or not? So uh, they're hard to, to define. They're not defined as being Mediterranean or Castilian. They're just whalers. Um, and the sources are uh, not many. Up until the Catalan Civil War in uh, 1462, there are whalers that are uh, using raw ores. They're, they have this mixed typology. And uh, well, this is the case at that time. I don't know if this answers the question, really. Muy bien, pues. Ah, una última pregunta, que luego ya pasamos ya... One last question, because then we're moving uh, on to conclusions. Thank you. Es para Miquel, es respecto a lo que... Miquel, about what you... Miquel es, ¿no? Uh, no, no, es el Miquel. Miquel. Is it Miquel? Marcel, Marcel. Marcel, perdón. And you are Marcel. All right, sorry. Uh, yesterday you were speaking uh, in the... Uh, in this context of uh, changing systems, copying the Atlantic system. I understand that this is a technology change, um, but uh, it's very hard for me to understand what uh, is the advantage of change, changing uh, sails, uh, really, um, changing the sail that can uh, sail against the wind by another uh, ship that cannot do that. Uh, something I don't understand. Well, it, there is a, an economic uh, economical reason. They used to have two masts, but now they only have one with a square um, sail. And I think you need less uh, crew, and therefore you're saving in salaries, in people, in food, in drinks, etc., etc. So it's due to the savings? Yes, but you can waste time as well. Uh, if change uh, shifts, then you have to go back. Yes, I know that, yes. I'm aware of that, but uh, the truth is that um, a single mast uh, with a square sail uh, is imposed. Of course, the Latin type of sails continue to be used. One of the things we need to take into consideration when we uh, assess all these elements like speed, etc., and in fleeting contracts, this is very well established. You know, uh, you have uh, many concepts that are well established in those contracts, uh, and any improvement uh, in terms of speed is uh, welcome, really, because it means a lot of, of savings in these contracts. Uh, you know that you're going to be uh, waiting for 15, 20 days in a, in a, in a harbor. Sorry, if no mic's being used, we cannot translate. The sound doesn't reach the translation booth. Puerto 20 días a que te descarguen y carguen de nuevo, pues da un poco igual la velocidad. Yes, and this is why uh, Marcel said that it seems that you uh, you're saving, uh, making savings in salaries and not in sailing time, and sailing capacity. Yeah, you're right. Sobre la presencia de naves. The presence of. Um, ships coming from northern Iberian coast in the Mediterranean. Why is your hypothesis focusing on whether they are uh, coming from Galicia or the Basque Country and not so much on the, or you're not including uh, ships coming from uh, the region of Asturias or Cuatro Villas? Fine. Uh, there were hardly any ships from Asturias. And I don't think there's a, 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 any tradition at all there. And as for Cantabria, we only have 25,000. Uh, out of 25,000 uh, ships registers, I only found one ship from Laredo. And I could have included it, but it, it, it's not much, really. Um, especially in the first half of the 14th century, we have news from Majorca having uh, cocks from Castro 
which is in Cantabria, but I don't think that in this century this was uh, very common, really. Well, you see in the 14th century is a presence of people coming from Cantabria, but as I said earlier, they're all called Vizcaínos. Uh, you have news about a skipper coming from Sant Andres, which is Santander, and that person is called a Vizcaíno, even if he comes from uh, Cantabria. You don't have anyone coming from Asturias or, or Galicia in the 14th century. They're all, uh, they all start appearing in the 15th century. And the question about whether, why we have Galician and Portuguese uh, people and not uh, people from Asturias, this is a question I wondered myself years ago and I asked Casado Soto, because he's an expert, and uh, he said that probably because you don't have any coastal platform uh, there. If you don't have fishers, you don't have sailors. activity so well that was a short answer um, it could be uh, it could be much longer because we have a large uh, coastal platform in here you know because if you wonder why are Basques, uh, where are the Basques, why do they go fishing uh, abroad? Because it don't, you don't have much fishing tradition here. Yes, if you have fishermen, you do have sailors. Uh, and if you don't have fishermen, any fishermen at all, at all, there won't be any sailors.